Good morning, everybody. This is a live emergency briefing on the threat of severe weather across the northeastern U.S., and that includes the threat of tornadoes maximized across eastern New York, northeastern Pennsylvania, possibly into Vermont as well, depending on how far north that uh, surface-based instability can progress. But there you can see my main target area uh, for that isolated tornadoes. But the threat of severe weather is going to extend a little bit beyond that. And here you can see the looped HRRR model. This is the latest HRRR. Even though I'm not a fan of the HRRR, especially with its dry biases up there, uh, which do uh, are, are a lot worse in the high plains than uh, of the eastern U.S., it still can often be right for the wrong reasons and often nails the convective evolution and the timing uh, of the uh, convective evolution. But it does look like a squall line is going to initiate uh, by mid-afternoon across central New York. Uh, there you can see that squall line, some embedded supercell structures within there as well. But the instability doesn't quite make it uh, farther north in central Vermont. Uh, that instability is going to be streaming off to the north uh, with uh, time out ahead of that uh, convective line. Uh, but there you can see uh, that convective line on the latest HRRR model marching off to the east. And all of this is because of a big time trough uh, in the northeastern U.S., and uh, here you can see the loop of the GFS model, 500 millibars. Look at that trough amplify over the eastern U.S., bringing a lot of strong flow across the northeastern U.S. there. That trough amplifies across eastern Canada, uh, bringing uh, with it a belt, a very strong mid-level flow across the northeastern U.S., cyclonic flow as well. Here is the HRRR looped uh, 0 to 1 kilometer EHI, and you can see that that uh, instability basically gets pinched off in central Vermont. See that instability there as that front comes surging off uh, from the northwest to the southeast. That front uh, pinches off that instability from central Vermont off to the south. But eastern and southeastern New York looks like it has uh, the best co-location of that uh, 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity and surface based instability. Looks like east central New York, maybe into western Massachusetts, far southern Vermont. Uh, that looks to be the best location for tornado uh, potential. And uh, all of that is because of a big-time low-level jet as well that is going to evolve across the northeastern U.S. So let's look at the uh, three-kilometer NAM and uh, break down uh, some of the uh, details here with this severe weather setup. Uh, there you can see that 500-millibar uh, map back behind the target area. Uh, cyclonic curvature across the northeastern U.S. on the south side of that trough is uh, definitely apparent there uh, bring it with it some very strong bulk shear as well across the target area so that front is going to be situated right along the leading edge of that strongest flow and that front is going to be surging off to the due east bringing with it uh, that convection as well but you can see out ahead of the front Plenty of strong mid-level flow, uh, greater than 50 knots at 500 millibars. That's going to create bulk shear in excess of 40 knots out there. That is going to support those supercell structures. Uh, a couple of negatives that might uh, preclude uh, supercells from forming uh, would be a surging cold front. So if that cold front is moving just a little bit too fast, it'll act to undercut those individual updrafts, and that will lead to a more linear configuration, more of a squall line with a damaging wind threat. Uh, but I do believe that uh, supercell structures are going to be in inevitable uh, embedded within within that squall line even there. And uh, because of that cyclonic curvature aloft, uh, the uh, favorable kinematics, that is going to excite a robust low-level jet. And so this is the forecast 850 millibar flow uh, here uh, by the 3-kilometer dam. Uh, my favorite uh, model for breaking down those small-scale environments that uh, can lead to uh, tornado potential. And with that strong cyclonic curvature aloft, that's going to create quite a backed low-level jet here. And uh, this is at uh, 850 uh, millibars. The strongest low-level jet is located from northeastern Pennsylvania across eastern New York. The entire state of Massachusetts, large portions of New England are going to be uh, impacted by that strong low-level jet. Even Maine has a low-level jet in excess of 40 knots up there uh, across New England. Uh, but the... Uh, uh, the uh, Tornado potential is going to be dependent on how far north that instability axis can advect. And it looks like that instability is going to go all the way up to about central Vermont. And then that front's going to surge off to the southeast. And it is going to pinch off that instability across southeastern New York, 
western Massachusetts, northwestern Connecticut there, maybe even back into eastern Pennsylvania and uh, northwestern New Jersey as well. So a pretty favorable low-level jet that is quite backed as well. Erasing all of that. Uh, looks like the most favorable low-level jet co-located uh, with that instability. Uh, we'll be back here across eastern New York and southern Vermont. Uh, looks quite favorable for that tornado potential. We're going to break down some of those forecast photographs as well. Uh, first, let's take a look at the dew point, and I can show you uh, where that uh, forecast instability axis is going to reside. Uh, this is the 3 kilometer NAM forecast dew point. And you can definitely see that at 21Z, the model images that I'm showing you are all for about 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, this is about at the peak of the severe weather event. And you can see that moisture streaming all the way up into central Vermont. Uh, even up there close to Burlington gets into the mid-60s, even a 67 over northeastern Vermont. So I do think that with mid-60s dew points up there, definitely uh, still the threat of surface-based instability. You can even see some mid-60s dew points all the way up there uh, near Montreal. But the really deep dew points back across eastern Pennsylvania into east-central New York, western Massachusetts as well. Uh, some dry conditions, though, to the northeast of that uh, dominating uh, over New Hampshire, central and eastern Massachusetts. Uh, just a little bit of dry happening there. But that low-level jet pumps moisture northward, reaching central uh, Vermont, especially southern Vermont, has some of those upper upper 60s dew points. And I do have a new setup here for my live stream, so that's why I'm working a little bit clunky. But I am getting better at it. I'll get used to it fast, and eventually these briefings will be smooth as butter. Uh, here you can see the forecast cape. Convective, available, potential energy here, surface base cape. And uh, this will show you that at 21Z, uh, it shows you just how far that instability axis extends. Dominating eastern Pennsylvania, eastern New York, surface base instability streaming all the way up. The Hudson River Valley up there as well. And that surface base instability does uh, encompass the whole entire state of Vermont. And I think with the more favorable low-level wind shear up there across Vermont, you are going to get more of a QLCS tornado threat uh, further northeast there. But I do think that east central New York, eastern Pennsylvania, uh, to the south, I do think that the instability there is sufficient for supercell storms. But the low-level shear is not as favorable, basically, to the south of northeastern Pennsylvania. So northeastern Pennsylvania to eastern New York, that's where that low-level shear is maximized. Uh, but that instability access reach, re reaches all the way up to near the... Uh, to uh, very close to, close to the uh, Montreal area up there into southern Quebec. And here you can see the storm relative helicity. Uh, those yellow colors there just below my head. Let me get rid of my head here so you can see how far northeast that favorable low-level wind shear extends. And it does extend all the way up into western Maine uh, within the core of that low-level jet axis. Uh, that extends actually the most favorable Low-level wind shear extends well to the north of that instability axis even. And uh, this is the storm relative helicity. I'm about to uh, show you a, uh, a forecast photograph as well from this environment. But first I wanted to annotate this. And uh, you can see that the uh, greatest 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity extends down into northeastern Pennsylvania, northern New Jersey, uh, as well as uh, Connecticut. Uh, there, Western Massachusetts and Southern Vermont has a very strong zero to one kilometer helicity. The yellows there are greater than 200 meters squared per second squared, zero to one kilometer SRH. And the greatest SRH is definitely over Central and Southern Vermont, Eastern New York, Western Massachusetts, kind of that hot spot here in New England for that tornado potential. But decent shear all the way back down into Northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, the convective line is going to be back here by this time at 4 or 5 p.m. Central New York, back into Central Pennsylvania, but it is going to be moving into that favorable low-level jet axis there across Eastern New York and uh, Southern Vermont as well. So now let's take a look at the forecast photograph. Basically, East Central New York, uh, right in the vicinity of that greater storm relative uh, helicity there, the yellow, uh, that's where that storm relative helicity is greater uh, than about uh, 200 uh, meters squared per second squared. So let me pull up the uh, forecast photograph. This is the uh, three kilometer NAM 
forecast photograph, you could see uh, 71 over 68. Not as much in the way of surface heating out there, uh, but if you can get those surface temperatures into the mid-70s, that'll create even more cape. You can see a pretty favorable elevated mix layer in there too. Basically that dry uh, area of, of air coming into the mid-levels of the troposphere above about three kilometers. Uh, that dry air is acting to steepen these lapse rates. The red line there is temperature. The rate at which that decreases with height is uh, called the lapse rate. And uh, when it cools a lot more dramatically, when you have cool, dry air aloft, uh, that creates an unstable configuration when it's over that over top that heat and moisture. And look at this wind profile here. Almost due southerly winds at the surface, flipping around to a southwesterly wind at about a kilometer up, about 40 knots uh, there, of about one kilometer. So kinematically, this is a very favorable setup uh, for tornadoes. Really the only negative factor uh, is how far north uh, that instability is able to infect. Uh, is it going to be able to reach uh, that maximum in the 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative felicity across southern Vermont and into uh, eastern New York? Or is it going to stop in northeastern Pennsylvania where there's still enough 0 to 1 kilometer shear uh, there for a tornado threat? Let me get my head away from that photograph here. Let me try to zoom in on the photograph portion too which is basically a way to plot the wind profile with height, but you're looking down at that wind profile. So looking down at the photograph, the shape of those uh, photographs can also determine uh, how favorable the tornado potential is. Uh, is the wind shear favorable relative to that storm motion? And uh, there you can see that photograph right there. And uh, the more curved a photograph like that, the more sickle shape, uh, is more favorable for tornado potential. It's going to be bringing in streamwise vorticity at a lot of different levels in the atmosphere. And you can see that one kilometer wind up here at about 40 knots out of the due south. These are vectors uh, that are plotted. Uh, the origin right about there. Uh, an, a southwesterly uh, wind uh, would get plotted up in this area of the photograph, basically where the wind is blowing. A uh, southeasterly wind, easterly component winds would be plotted up here. And uh, this is a pretty favorable photograph. Uh, you can see a lot of curvature there. Surface wind at about 10 knots out of the due south. Uh, there is your surface wind vector, due south at about 10 knots. One kilometer wind, south to southwest at about 40 knots. And then your very strong mid-level winds out here out of the due southwest ahead of that cyclonically curved upper level trough. Uh, that's uh, quite a bit of directional shear, quite a bit of speed shear also with this photograph. And your storm motion out there east south easterly or east excuse me uh east northeasterly storm motion there at about 30 knots and that area enclosed within the storm motion curve and that curved photograph which are the uh, shear vectors up there the area within that enclosed by that is proportional to your storm relative felicity and uh, here you can see that storm relative felicity pushing 200 there in the zero to one kilometer layer more than sufficient for a tornado threat certainly and uh, this we are looking at the northeast there you can see that zero to one kilometer ehi showing you just how far that instability axis is able to penetrate northward into central vermont basically makes it up into southern vermont and uh, that's where the greatest co-location of surface based instability and that strong low level shear is going to be located and that extends down into southeastern new york western massachusetts as well storm mode could be a limiting factor for tornadoes as well, uh, definitely depends. Uh, you need a supercell storm really to move into this environment. And uh, the speed at which that cold front is advancing certainly could uh, act to minimize that tornado threat as well. So I'm going to go back to the internet here. So we were just breaking down the 0 to 3 kilometer NAM forecast fields for 21Z. Now I'm looping the forecast fields here across the, uh, across the entire forecast period of the uh, HRRR model to show you that convective evolution. This is a forecast composite reflectivity. Uh, I usually don't like using the HRRR model because it has such a dry bias and it doesn't handle those low-level thermodynamics very well. But you can certainly see supercell storms 
across the entire state of Vermont by late afternoon, by about 4 or 5 p.m. They fire at about 2 to 3 p.m. in central New York, moves rapidly across the northeastern U.S., including the entire state of Vermont. And you want to look for these individual blobs of storms. Those are the supercell storms. Uh, or even embedded supercell storms within that line. You can see overall a, a general squall line that extends all the way down to the Ohio River Valley, uh, down into central and eastern Virginia as well, eastern Maryland, and uh, that convective line and those supercell storms do evolve across northeastern Pennsylvania, northwestern New Jersey as well, uh, as you can see. So... Certainly, I think we're going to see numerous tornado warnings, a lot of severe thunderstorm warnings for damaging straight-line winds with this squall line moving across eastern New York, uh, the entire state of Vermont, into western Massachusetts as well. Uh, there you can see. Let's see how it does with the dew points. The PivotalWeather.com website is a great model to visualize the moisture return, and it does have that dry bias, but it is the northeast, so... Look at that, the 50s dew points here, and then you get rapid moisture transport into eastern New York. The max dew point there in central Vermont reaches about 63, so it still has a dry bias even in the northeastern U.S. We're going to have to look at the surface map here really quick to see just how rapid that moisture return is going to be underway, but there is quite a dry environment in place across the northeastern U.S., and then that moisture arrives just a little bit late. By late afternoon, this is 15Z, 20Z right there. You can see that moisture streaming northward up the Hudson River Valley. So if the late arrival of that moisture is a concern, then you're going to have more of a QLCS, kind of a skinny squall line across uh, Vermont. And then as soon as that deeper moisture hits a portion of that line, I do think that there is a potential of some supercell storms. So let's look at the 3 kilometer nm rate of moisture return. And this is a much more accurate depiction of that moisture return than the HRRR, which does have that dry bias. Uh, this is the 3 kilometer nm 60-hour loop beginning at 12Z. Look at that front come in, drying out. Nice temperatures here across the northeast. Starting to feel like fall back behind uh, this cold front as well. Pretty strong cold front out here. So here you can see the moisture. 70s dew points across eastern Pennsylvania, all the way up into far eastern New York, up the Hudson River Valley. And uh, this, uh, the three kilometer NAM, has about a 65 dew point reaching central Vermont, even a 65 reaching all the way up into Burlington up there uh, in northeastern Vermont. Let's loop the uh, surface based cape here. And the best kinematics, the best low level wind shear is over Vermont. So let's see just how far north. This uh, robust cape is able to reach. Let me start over again with this loop. So there you can see that cape. This is at 21Z. And it definitely shows a surge in that cape above 1,500 surface space capes all the way up the river valley there. Uh, far up, up near the uh, New York-Vermont border extending almost up to the Canadian border. Uh, but all the way up to Burlington, definitely gets uh, into the 1500 Cape. Uh, you get pushing 3000 Cape back there into eastern Pennsylvania. So you have greater instability off to the south, eastern New York into northeastern Pennsylvania. Better wind shear, though, into southern Vermont and uh, western Massachusetts and eastern New York. Uh, let's uh, extend just one frame at a time. And then that axis starts to get skinny. So the instability doesn't advance east of Vermont. I think New Hampshire, you're going to be safe from the severe weather. That dry air, that dome is able to hold on uh, within that mountainous terrain. But it does look like that instability axis is going to surge north across the uh, Vermont and New York border. And let's just for fun look at a forecast sounding here right along the border, pretty far north, right at the very northern edge of that instability axis and uh, you kind of have a lot of cloud cover up there dominating the state of Vermont. Look at all this saturation, that green line and the red line overlaid all the way up through 500 millibars. So there's not going to be a lot of, in the way of breaks in the clouds up there despite that 72 over 68 profile. A little bit of stable air right at the surface as well but and, and uh, the, the uh, storm motions are a little bit more meridional that far north as well into northern Vermont. Uh, whereas a little bit further south, you get into southern Vermont, and you get slightly better. 
That's a little bit too early. Let's uh, go back to our time of 21Z. There we go. Let's go a little bit further south, close to northeastern Pennsylvania, eastern New York. Hodographs, despite a little bit more of an easterly storm motion due northeast, the low-level jet even still pretty backed. You get a little bit more of an elevated mix layer contributing to greater cape, thicker cape up there with some drier air coming in, breaks in the clouds as well. You're probably going to see those temperatures nose up into the mid-70s. Not as much directional shear further south, but you still do have that pretty favorable hodograph uh, just below my head of about 150 zero to one kilometer storm relative felicity. Usually here in the northeastern U.S., you get a lot more wind shear contributed uh, by speed shear rather than directional shear. So if you do get any directional shear, it certainly can go a long way out there as well. So let's take a look now at your storm relative felicity in a zero to one kilometer sense. And you can see overall uh, the zero to one kilometer SRH is greater off to the north, but you still do have that 150 zero to one kilometer shear extending pretty far south. This is at 12Z. Go closer to 21Z. See how it lifts off to the north? But you still have that near 200 zero to one kilometer shear in northeastern Pennsylvania, eastern New York, southern Vermont, and uh, that's where the best wind shear is located. We could pick a forecast photograph right there in southern Vermont. And man, look at that elevated mix layer coming in here. Look at that directional shear. You have south-southeasterly winds at the surface down there at the low levels, flipping around to southwesterly about a kilometer above the ground. Very favorable hodograph there for tornado potential across southern Vermont. Decent low-level lapse rates too there with some heating happening beneath that elevated mix layer as well. So that's a pretty dangerous forecast sounding there for southern Vermont. And definitely the uh, best forecast photographs, the best wind shear profile, and you get a little bit of surface base instability there. Some breaks in the clouds. Looks like the best, most favorite. And look at that zero to one kilometer shear at zero Z. Dominating Vermont, ejecting off to the northeast. Very favorable storm relative felicity. The instability, though, does get pinched off to the south. Looks like central Vermont down into western Massachusetts is where a majority of that instability is located. And though even though you have a big uptick in that low-level shear extending even up into far southeastern uh, Quebec there, just not a ton of surface base instability, but you are pushing 300 zero to one kilometer storm relative felicity, big hodograph, not as much instability up there, not as much of a prominent elevated mix layer, 68 over 65, you don't get as much surface uh, heating kind of more of a skinny cape environment later on as that instability gets pinched off to the south. But very favorable low-level jet there. Low-level jet in excess of 40 knots, quite backed as well. Well, at least in excess of 30 knots. That's at 13Z, so we can go forward to 0Z and watch it ramp up 40 to 50 knots across the state of Vermont. So Vermont's going to have a big low-level jet Similar to the kind of low-level jet that when you wake up in the morning in Oklahoma during the spring and look up in the air and see that southerly low-level cloud just racing south to north, barely at, uh, almost feeling like you could touch those low-level clouds. That's what, what it's going to be like this evening across basically the entire state of Vermont back into eastern New York. And I do think that there's going to be a skinny squall line with embedded supercell structures Little circulations there moving through that mountainous terrain of Vermont. This is right at about sunset there. Look at that low-level jet, and it does push toward Maine, even though you, you lose your surface base instability as you're getting a little bit closer to midnight there. The timing, just not appropriate to get a tornado threat across the state of Maine. Let's look at the forecast composite reflectivity from the 3-kilometer NAM and uh, see what it predicts. 17Z, right about midday is when you start to get an eruption of storms across central New York, back into northeastern Pennsylvania. I do think that there is definitely a chance of a tornado potential as well back into northeastern Pennsylvania with that initial mode. Ah.
There's our convective line as forecast by the three kilometer NAM. It doesn't show as much, well, it does there by zero Z, but look at those embedded supercell structures approaching Vermont from Eastern New York. So by 21 Z down here across Northeastern Pennsylvania to the west of Scranton, looks like some supercell structures lined up, a pretty favorable environment down there as well. This is at four to 5 p.m. Uh, and then these are eventually going to start moving into eastern New York. So the timing of these storms, it might be too late of an arrival uh, for this convection into eastern New York. That's at 6 p.m. So we're getting close to sunset already there. Uh, but I do think that there's likely going to be some tornado warnings with this cluster in the Adirondacks back into northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, possibly some supercell structures as well in uh, eastern Maryland down there. But the wind shear does eject rapidly up toward Vermont with time by about 7 or 8 p.m. And then that squall line moves through Vermont. And with that 40 to 50 knot low level jet, I do think there's going to be some embedded tornado circulations within that squall line up there through Vermont. And then it loses steam by the time it arrives in New Hampshire and Maine, despite strong low level shear. Uh, just too much of a nocturnal inversion builds up and you definitely lose that surface space instability with these storms. But the three kilometer dam is also showing that threat of some renegade storms back into eastern Maryland, even southeastern Pennsylvania, maybe into Philadelphia by zero Z, but with some more veered low level shear, I think damaging straight line winds is uh, mainly going to be the threat with that mode down there as well. Looking at the large scale, there you can see our trough departing off the northeast coast. You're looking at the GFS here. So let's go back with time. And look at that anticyclone that's anchored over the western U.S. See it right there. Relatively zonal flow over top of it. There's our trough moving uh, across James Bay. Southern Quebec. That's another trough, actually. There's our trough. <laughs> so it looks like you're going to get more severe weather as well toward the end of the period in the northeast. But this is the trough south of Hudson Bay, a belt of pretty strong cyclonically curved to mid-level flow over the northeastern U.S. That's bringing the severe weather here, exciting that low-level jet that's pumping the moisture northward through eastern Pennsylvania, eastern New York, and Vermont. And then you have this massive anticyclone over the southwestern U.S. And this anticyclone is going to migrate east closer to the Four Corners by the end of the week. And the southerly return flow on the backside of that anticyclone is going to reinvigorate monsoon conditions across the southwestern U.S. as well. So step, stepping forward with time, see that anticyclone slide to the east closer to the Four Corners. And the southerly flow on the west side of that anticyclone is going to bring that moisture surge back across California, Nevada, possibly Arizona as well. God, these mouse, mouses are hard to use on here. And there's your next trough too, dabbing southeast out of the Canadian prairies toward the northeastern U.S. So that high pressure by the end of the week, by Friday, you're going to have return flow out of the eastern Pacific. You've also got a tropical system down there near Baja that's going to infuse moisture uh, as well uh, within this uh, return flow on the western edge of that high. And I do think there's going to be an energized monsoon as well out there across the southwestern U.S. We are going to have to keep a close eye on that. Maybe I'll have to chase uh, the uh, flash flooding down there once again. In the monsoon conditions let me lift this just a little bit north so that you can see that anti-cyclone there we go so definitely a late summer fall monsoon pattern tropical system down there near Baja uh, that definitely could infuse the moisture here with that southerly flow you've also got your classic little trough here across the north Pacific Northwest and the squeeze play between that high pressure and that little trough is going to uh, cause that moisture to advect northward. So I think there's going to be a pretty decent monsoon across Arizona, Utah, end of this week through the weekend. Look at that uh, high pressure anchored across the Four Corners region. That tropical system looks like it cur curls northwest finally. 
And then we return to more zonal flow across the northern U.S. See that consolidated jet with a large anticyclone across the southern U.S.? A pretty favorable blocking pattern to uh, prevent tropical cyclones from recurving to the north out in Bermuda. So maybe we'll start to lose this pattern right now with Hurricane Larry causing it to curve to the north toward Newfoundland. We kind of have a belt, anticyclonic belt across the southern U.S., Definitely would act to block any systems and cause them to move into the Gulf of Mexico. There is a little weak tropical system down in the northern Gulf of Mexico that's forecast to head off to the northeast. That does have moderate potential for development. Looks like it's going to be a low-end tropical cyclone, though. Maybe a tropical depression bringing some heavy rain across northern Florida. I know that there is a 2% tornado risk down there as well across northwestern Florida out ahead of that system. But I could see a reinvigoration of the Northern Plains season, severe weather, depending on the moisture situation, maybe in some post-frontal environments here across the High Plains by this weekend into early next week. And then we return to that big anticyclone over the western U.S., tendency for troughs to move across the northeastern U.S. with more severe weather. And we're going toward the middle part of September. And uh, it's like a pretty active fall season. We do have that tendency, though, for that anticyclone to dominate across the northwest. And then it looks like in the very long range, at about 10, 20 days out, 15 days out, we may have a breakdown in that pattern toward the end of September and uh, could get a pretty active season out there. But we are way out in la-la land out here with the operational GFS. But it looks like this trough is going to bring severe weather across the northeast and another one on its heels right there. Looks like this weekend could be another system. Not as much moisture, though, with this one. Not quite as deep. A little bit more progressive. Decent low-level jet, though, across the northeast should bring that moisture back up again. No, it starts over. So that's more of a veered low-level jet, notice. There it is across the northeast, more westerly low-level winds for this weekend. But could bring some severe weather and another cold frontal passage this weekend with that system as well. But this one today is a lot more favorable for severe weather across the northeast. And the best conditions are across southern Vermont, And uh, into eastern New York. And also I could see a threat back into northeastern Pennsylvania as well. Here's my official target area in red. And I did extend it almost all the way up to the Canadian border. Just because I think there is a potential for surface base instability. To reach almost up to the Burlington area. I think that the HRRR has that dry bias a bit. And is underestimating just how far north that surface base instability is going to reach in Vermont. And I could easily see at least central Vermont developing that tornado potential, but it is going to arrive late. It looks like during the evening hours, and you'll start to lose a little bit of that surface heating, transitioning to more of a QLCS, skinny squall line, moving into that strong low-level jet this evening. But I do think at about 4 or 5 p.m., there will be some supercells in northeastern Pennsylvania into southeastern New York, and then that line will push into Vermont closer to sunset, and there still might just be enough surface base instability to uh, have a tornado threat up there as well. So thank you everybody for tuning in to my weather reports this morning. Hope you enjoyed them. Stay safe. Stay tuned to those watches and warnings across portions of the Northeast, especially Southern Vermont, into Eastern New York, Western Massachusetts, back into Northeastern Pennsylvania. Stay tuned to those watches and warnings. Mainly a straight line damaging wind threat, but I do think that there is a threat of an isolated tornado or two. Uh, especially southern Vermont, eastern New York, into western Massachusetts. Have a great rest of your day today. Never stop chasing.